Everything we do as Christians is directed toward the Father. And though we bear the name of Christ, we nevertheless are not... We don't terminate our faith in Jesus. We terminate our faith in the Father. That's where we're headed. That's where we're intended to go. And it's through Christ and in Christ and by Christ that we get to where he wants us to be, where ultimately we want to be in the heart of the Father. Everything's about the Father. It's all about being reconciled to the Father. Jesus came down uh, and wed his divinity to our humanity so that our humanity, wed to his divinity, could have a home in the heart of the Father, where the Son is. Our worship is directed to the Father. We offer to the Father the sacrifice of his only begotten Son in the Most Holy Eucharist. And we, as members of that same body that is broken and offered to the Father in sacrifice, in death, in resurrection, are offered with him. We are, in Jesus Christ, made a holy priesthood, a people set apart from the rest of the world to offer spiritual sacrifice to the Father. We don't exist in this world to be preoccupied with this world. We exist in this world to worship God. Our whole life is meant to be ordered and directed to this particular day. Our whole week is meant to lead us to this Sunday where having worked to live, we can now live in peace and in rest on, a, on the Sunday, the Sabbath. That's a big it's a big difference in the way that a lot of us think. So many of us, you know, to use the, the phrase, so many of us live to work, right? So many of us live to do well in school. So many of us live to get a good job. So many of us live to make it to retirement. Rather than saying, I do all of these things so that I can facilitate the freedom in my life, to be a disciple of Jesus Christ, how and when he demands me to be, right? A good example of this is the, the great conflict that so many parents have, the struggle, and, and I'm sympathetic to this. I, there's, there's, no, there's no tone of condemnation um, in, in, in my articulation of this. It is, it's wrong, but I'm, I'm completely sympathetic to it. Parents who invest their children's time so thoroughly in their schooling and in their sports, and perhaps even as they get older, in their job after school, that they themselves as parents don't have any time from going to work, getting home, changing, taking the kids to practice, coming home, making a quick meal, putting the kids in the shower, and then putting them to bed, and then crashing themselves, that no one in their family has time to be a Christian. No one in their family has time to rest, to, to abide in Jesus in their home. That their week is so busy that no one gives thought to the coming Sabbath and how they're looking forward to resting in the peace and the freedom that Christ gives that they don't have time to prepare and anticipate the coming sacrifice that they're going to participate in by which they make of themselves an offering to the Father. To examine their conscience to determine whether or not they're fit to offer that sacrifice. Whether or not they need to go to the Lord at some other time during the week to go to confession in order to prepare themselves for that sacrifice. We don't exist in this world to be slaves to this world, to hold ourselves to the standard of society. The only standard to which we need to hold ourselves is the standard of Christ. And how well have I loved the Father in Jesus Christ today? This is where Peter starts talking about Jesus. Behold, I'm laying a stone in Zion, a cornerstone chosen and precious, and whoever believes in it shall not be put to shame. And yet, he goes on and says, 
Therefore, its value is for you who have faith, but for those without faith, the stone that the builders reject becomes a cornerstone, a stone that will make people stumble and a rock that will make them fall. Isn't that kind of mean to say about our fluffy unicorn Jesus? That he's, that he's going to get in somebody's way? That he'll actually be a hindrance to somebody? Doesn't Jesus just absorb and ooze ooze out love into the whole world and then absorb all people regardless of their disposition and intention into his heart? No, Jesus is a rock. He's a stone. He is his own shape. He is his own person. And it is our job as living stones made to fit around him to be made to fit around him. To change our lives, our expectations to fit around him. And the only reason that we would be willing to change the life that we have grown so comfortable in, the only reason we would examine it and ask, is this the best way to live? The only reason in discovering that it's not the best way to live, that there's a better way to live, the only reason we would change it is if we have faith in Jesus and recognize that he is the reason that we live in this world, the reason we have a hope in this world, a joy in this world, a peace in this tumultuous world, and that it is ours to have. If only we allow the, the, the stonemason, the divine stonemason, the tecton, to chip away at our shape so that we fit into its proper place around the cornerstone. Because here's the thing, once you lay the cornerstone, it becomes the reference point for all the other stones. Everything is referenced to the cornerstone. And if there is a piece of material in the rest of the build that does not reference correctly to the cornerstone, guess what happens to it? It gets chucked out. That stone refuses to be shaped into a triangle so that it fits here in relation to the cornerstone. Get rid of it. This piece of timber refuses to bend such that it can fit into these series of stones that fit around this cornerstone. Get rid of it. We are being built into a spiritual house, a temple of God. Each one of us a member of the body of Christ. Each one of us a living stone meant to fit into the edifice of the temple which is Jesus Christ. To the glory and worship and satisfaction of the Father. But if we refuse to live our lives in reference to Christ the cornerstone... Switching metaphors here. We become blind people who trip over it. It becomes a burden to us. I've recently had somebody tell me, complain to me, why does religion have to be so hard? But here's the thing. Religion, well, right religion, Christianity, is liberating. It only becomes hard when we try to be a different shape that doesn't fit into the temple. Christianity is only hard when we insist on being a square peg and Christ says, I am a round hole. And we refuse to have our edges curved around so that we fit into that round hole. Christianity only becomes hard, therefore, when we insist on doing things our way. when we pursue our own pleasures to the expense of right worship, when we pursue our own plans and our own, our own uh, comfort and our own luxury and our own um, material wealth and, and material gain to the expense of the liberating freedom that comes with the generosity of charity. Remember what the first, apostle, what the first disciples used to do. They, when, when someone in their community was poor, they wouldn't just reach into their pocket and see what kind of change they had left over to hand them. They went and sold something that they had and already enjoyed and got rid of it. They made their lives smaller so that they could provide for the needs of another person. That's the shape of a Christian. 
That's, the, that's the, the stone, that living stone being chiseled down and being shaped so that it has its proper place in the temple that ascends in glory to be the new Jerusalem with streets paved in gold. Christianity only becomes burdensome if we try to do it in any way less than totality. If Christianity is not your reason for being, it will be burdensome for you. You will stumble over Christ. He will not be your access to heaven. He will, in fact, be the thing that causes you to trip and stumble into hell. Because Christ is uncompromising. He tells us exactly who he is, exactly how to be united to him. He says, repent and be baptized. He says, eat my flesh and drink my blood, lest you have no life within you. But if you eat my flesh, if you drink my blood, you will have eternal life welling up inside of you. He tells us these are the things you must do, and if you do them, you will have eternal life with me. He doesn't say, these are the things you must do, and if you choose not to do them, that's fine, you'll have eternal life anyways. Remember here, Jesus says to Thomas, well, he says to his apostles, you know where I'm going. Remember, he made them his friends, he says. You're no longer my servants or my slaves, but you're my friends because slaves don't know what they're doing or what their master is doing. But I have told you all things. And so he says to his apostles, from now on you can... Oh, let's see, how does he say it? I will come back for you and take you to myself so that where I am going, you also may be. Where I am going, you know the way. There it is. Where I am going, you know the way. And Thomas says to him, Master, we don't know where you're going. How can we know the way? Jesus essentially here says, you don't have to worry about where you're going to end up. You only have to worry about going the way that I have gone. And Thomas says, okay, so what is that? And Jesus says, I am the way I am the truth, and I am the life. I am the way. What that means is I am the way for you to be. Be like me, and you will be good. Be like me, and you will be right. It'll be, it, you'll be correct if you're like me. I am the way to be. I am the truth. What I have revealed of myself is the Father, and that is where I am going. And if you follow me, my revelation, if you understand my truth, the articulation of my Father that I have given you, you will find the Father. Think as I think. Understand as I have explained. Learn as I teach. Believe what I say. And I am the life. There is no life but me. If you wish to have life, you must be in me. I am the life. I am life. If you try to find life anywhere else, you won't find it because I am life. And in this world of plurality, in this, in this, in this world that, that, that not only has recognized the great plurality of, of ideas, most of which are wrong, it also has tried to reconcile those things, not by, not by changing people's minds to what is right, but by ignoring that there is a right and there is a wrong and just saying that everybody's fine. But that cannot be farther from the truth. That idea cannot be farther from Jesus. It is not okay. that there are people in the world who have not yet heard the gospel of Jesus Christ. And it is not okay that there are people in the world who are not Christians. And it is not okay that there are Christians in the world who have set down the mantle of the cross and pursued worldly things after they have been conformed to Christ. These things are not okay. But we don't have to despair. 
simply because the world is not okay, simply because there are people in the world who are on the road to perdition, but that we do that everything that we can, you and I individually, you and I as a parish community, you and I as a Christian community in this archdiocese and in this world, that you and I do everything that we can to make sure that we are following Jesus, that we are living in his way, that we are listening to and learning and obeying his truth, and that we are living in the freedom of his life, which he comes to give us, that we might have it and have it in abundance. And to do everything that we can to help those who instead of allowing themselves to be shaped into the living stone that fits in relation to the cornerstone in the great temple of God's body, but instead stumble over that cornerstone that is Jesus that we help them as best we can. That we do not pull our punches. We do not tell them that if they're not Christian that they're okay. But that in order to be okay, they ought to be Christian. But that we have lived our lives in a way that they will believe that. That we have conformed ourselves to Jesus to such a degree that when we say you should be a Christian, they see in us, they see Jesus, and they say, yes, you're right, that's how I want to be. We are, each of us, fitted into the body of Christ. If any one of us chooses to not take the shape that is required for us to be fitted where we belong in the body of Christ, we will not belong there for very long. Give yourself the freedom to be conformed from what you are today, and many of y'all are well, well on your way to all that is good that Jesus offers. But there's still something, there's always still something that we can look at and say, Lord, I'm a little proud here. Or I'm a little recessed here. Great, great stonemason, great tecton, come and mold me more perfectly to fit more perfectly into your, into your temple. Others of us are very far from being any sort of shape that belongs anywhere in a home. And that's okay. Everyone has to start somewhere. And in this moment, each one of us starts exactly where we are. But in this moment and at that place, we must cry out to the Lord and say, Lord, give me the humility, give me the love, give me the joy and the freedom to be molded into whatever shape you want me so that I can fit against that cornerstone and be joyful, joyfully placed in the temple of your son, so that as Jesus says, I will come back for you after I have prepared a place for you, a place in which you will fit. And when I do, I will come back and take you to myself, so that wherever I am, you also will be.